In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Um, those of you who've been uh, with us recently know that I've been doing a series of episodes about the subject, No Woman Should Be a Muslim. And uh, it was supposed to just be like two or three episodes, but every time we we talk about it, it opens up another subject that I feel is so important uh, to talk about, specifically about women in Islam. And uh, as uh, we also always say, the program is live. And if you would like to call to make a comment, if you'd like to uh, have a question, uh, if you'd like to share testimony about this subject, about women's rights within Islam, um, I would, I'd really love to hear from some Muslim women, <laughs> because uh, uh, if you have daughters, uh, any Muslim who has daughters, I'd, re I'd really love to hear from you about what you think about this, because these are the things we're talking about are in the Quran. The things we're talking about are in the Hadith. These are the words of Muhammad. These are the words of the God of Islam, Allah, in the Quran. And so it's very important, uh, you know, that you know this. I know most Muslims don't know these things. But these things are in the Quran. I mean, this is the final authority in Islam, the highest authority in Islam, say these things about women. And so that's why it's so important, uh, you know, to continue this series. And today, many of the subjects that we've talked about, for instance, the beating of women, about the uh, sex with prepubescent girls, which is permitted in the Quran, chapter 64, verse 5, and many other subjects that we have discussed since we started this program, the marriage of Aisha when she was six years old to Muhammad, consummation of that marriage when she was nine. Um, but today it's a subject that I, I have talked about it before, but it's a subject that for me, it just hurts. It is such a painful subject. It, it's just one of those things that just, I feel so bad for these girls that the Quran talks about. And these girls are called in Arabic, Melekat al-Yameen. Melekat al-Yameen, you know, some call it the queens of the right hand, but it doesn't mean queens. It means possessions of the right hand. Possess these are, that means girls that you own, slave girls. Because in the Quran, many, many, many times, the Quran says that men, Muslim men, are allowed to have sex with these girls that they own. And, and uh, today uh, we're blessed to have with us our brother, Sam Shimon, and he's going to also uh, help uh, elaborate and open up this subject uh, to discuss it with us. Um, Sam, are you there with us? Hello, Sam? Hello. Hey, how are you, Sam? Yes, yes. Can you hear me now? yes I, I hear you and I can see you. It's good to see you. It's great to have you on the show again. It's always a blessing when we have you here. Yes, the, the, the blessing is from the Lord Jesus. The honor is mine. And I just want to glorify the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, asking him to bless us by Amen. the power of the Holy Spirit, cover us by the blood of Jesus, and yes. anoint us to speak truth for the glory of Jesus. In Jesus' name, may the Spirit have his way with us. So Muslims Amen. get saved. We love Amen. you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah, and I was just kind of introducing, I was saying, you know, how, you know, when you read about these girls, they're called the possession of your right hand. These literally mean slaves. Uh, it's just so painful the way they have absolutely no rights uh, and the way that Allah and sometimes it seems like he's coming to the rescue of women. And he says to Muhammad, I believe it's 23 verse 5. He says, Muhammad, you're not allowed to marry any more women, you know, and, and, or to have sex with any other women except these slave girls, those that your right hand possesses. And it's like any rights that women have within Islam, they, uh, there's this except those your right hand possesses. These girls yes. have no rights, they have no voice, they have no say whatsoever in any way. And, uh, you know, what is your view of, you know, this particular subject? Yeah, just, uh, just one quick uh, minor correction. It's chapter 33, verse 52 that you're referring to, where Muhammad has said, and I can read the passage, there are various translations, but the beautiful thing is, since Arabic is your mother tongue, you can correct the mistranslations done by Muslims to try to sugarcoat the problems with the Quran. I just want to read it for the benefit of others. It mm -hmm. is not allowed 
to you, this is speaking to Muhammad, to take women afterward, afterwards, nor that you should change them for other wives, though their beauty <clears throat> be pleasing to you, except what your right hand possesses. This is what you're referring to. Yes. Except your right hand possesses, and Allah is watchful over all things. Now, many people don't realize this, and when I say many people, we're talking about the non-Muslims. So my goal, your goal, is to educate the non-Muslims, particularly our Christian brothers and sisters, so that by the power of the Spirit, they can be better informed to glorify Jesus Christ to the Muslims so they can see how immoral <clears throat> this, this religion is. Even though the Quran limits Muslim men to four wives if they can deal fairly with them, that's chapter 4 of the Quran, Surah Tanisa, verse 3, Muhammad was actually allowed to have more than that. So when we read 3352 in context, we have to keep in mind for the benefit of the Christians who don't know much about the Quran or the life of Muhammad, and even some Muslims may be shocked to hear this, Muhammad did not limit himself to four wives, though he imposed this on his followers in chapter 4, verse 3, because according to the traditions, he had up to 11 wives at one time, and he was proposing marriage with others. And when he died, he left nine wives behind. He widowed nine wives. But then chapter 4, verse 3 says, you should only have up to four wives if you can deal fairly with them. And Muhammad had more than that, and he was unfair to many of them. Now, with that said, the Quran nowhere limits the amount of concubines, slave girls, sex slaves a person can have. There is no limit to the amount of slave girls, or let me say, say it like it is. Let's not sugarcoat it. Sex, sex, sex slaves. slaves, yes. Yeah, that's what they are. I mean, yeah, they're not slaves, yeah. maids. They are sex slaves. Right. There is no limit to the number of sex slaves that not just Muhammad could have had, but Muslims today. Okay. So that means, theoretically... A Muslim can have 70 sex slaves. He mm -hmm. can have 100 sex slaves. He can have numerous sex slaves. There is no limit to the number of sex slaves that a Muslim man can have. So okay. that's the problem. We often okay. hear Muslims saying, well, the Quran limits a person to four wives. If he can be yeah, just. <laughs> yeah, but here's the problem, Muslim. Nowhere does the Quran limit the number of sex slaves a person can have, and yet they're reticent. To a shame to admit that fact. Yep. So yeah, this is a grossly immoral, sexually perverted religion. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, just nicely, right? Yes. You know what? You know what I'm going to do, uh, Sam's. I'm going to I'm going to play a video clip, and this is Basma Wahba, and she was a very uh, popular interviewer in the Middle East, and she did a program about this, and I have several clips from her that I'm going to play throughout the show today. And I just wanted to go ahead and play the first. Can we play the first video clip? And then I'm going to tell you what she said. I'll just real quickly tell you what she said there. She says, you know, and the reason I wanted to show this video is to show that this isn't some historical thing that happened 1,400 years ago and is dead today. This was, this was a recent uh, interview, uh, TV program, and she said in it that there were people from Al Azhar University. This is, the, you know, the most respected Sunni organization in the world and, uh, and a university. And she said that they said that if you have a woman that works in your house like a maid, Al Azhar said, it is permissible to you to treat her like she's your wife. Yes. And, and then she says, and all the men rejoiced. This is what she said. It was like a poem. And all the men rejoiced. And all the women sent their uh, maids far away. <laughs> You know, yeah. absolutely correct. She's 100 percent right. This is why a lot of non-Muslims, when they want to go to work in Muslim countries as maids, they don't realize what they're signing up for. They think they're just going there to work. They don't know that the moment they step on Muslim soil and they agree to become the maid of a Muslim family, they don't realize that part of the benefits, not benefits for her, benefits for the man is, She's now one of those that is right hands possessed, and he can sleep with her and have sex with her 
at will and she cannot object and there's no one to fight for her rights because now she's in Muslim soil, who's going to take up her cause when this is something ordained by Allah and his messenger? And Allah and his messenger take precedence over human laws and inventions. Yes. Yeah. See, they don't realize this, what they're getting into. They think they're just going to work. Mm -hmm. And you hear about the raping of Filipino maids and other maids in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. We call it rape because that's what it is. Yes. But Muslims say, no, this is a right enjoyed a right. on us right. by Allah and his messenger. Yes. And what Allah and his messenger legislate, no man can oppose or thwart yes. or refute. Yes. That, and I, I, you know, the last week I, when we were speaking, or the last time we were speaking, I said that. There was a man, there was an imam in New York, an imam in New York, not in a cave in Afghanistan, in New York. And he was talking about the fact that the Quran allows sex with prepubescent girls, girls who have not yet wow. menstruated. And yeah, this, he, yeah, he's the one who said, he said, hey, listen, no Muslim has the right to forbid what the Quran allows. And... There's 16 verses about these girls, about these uh, women who your right hand possesses. These are slave girls. These are sex slaves. It is in the Quran. It's, it's not just in some weird hidden book that no longer is used. This is in the Quran itself. If you have a Quran in your house, go and look at these verses. They are there. We're going to be looking at it. But one thing I want to just make certain for the benefit of the audience, and I want to just read three verses from the Quran to show you, especially for the non-Muslims. And this okay. is why these programs exist. We want to educate non-Muslims, specifically our Christian brothers and sisters, with the hopes that the Spirit will move them. Okay. Pray for the Muslims for their salvation. Yeah, absolutely. And ask the Spirit to fill you to be bold, holy, and I pray that for myself, holy witnesses for the glory of Jesus Christ, so that they can be moved in their spirit to see how evil, tyrannical, immoral this system is. And... This system has taken 1.7 billion Muslims captive, a system created by Satan to keep people away from the beauty and the holiness of Jesus Christ. But now, let me just look at three verses in the Quran that put things in perspective, <clears throat> showing why human law, when I say human law, any law that's not found in the Quran or in the traditions attributed to Muhammad cannot override the teachings of Muhammad because the Quran says, that when Muhammad speaks, pretty much that's Allah speaking because Muhammad is the human voice of Allah. And whatever Muhammad says supersedes all other opinions, rules, legislation. Let me read chapter 4 of the Quran, verse 65, to put this in perspective. The Surah An-Nisa, but I'll just give the chapter for, for easier reverence and convenience for non-Muslims. Chapter 4, verse 65. Notice what this says, brother. But nay, no, by, by your Lord, Muhammad. They will not believe until they make thee, you, judge of what is in dispute between them and find within themselves, find in, the, in their inner man, no dislike of that which you have decided. Let me repeat that. They must find within, the, within themselves no dislike like. of what you, Muhammad, decided. Now decided. watch the final phrase. <laughs> and submit with full submission. Let wow. me comment on that. Wow. Most Muslims tell you that Islam <laughs> means submitting to Allah. That's yeah. partial. This verse right here says, true Islam is when a Muslim, <clears throat> in internally, not just externally, not yeah. just pretending allegiance, feigning allegiance externally, but within his heart or her heart, has absolutely no doubt, hesitance, that what Muhammad says is truth, and they must perfectly submit to Muhammad. So true Islam is perfect submission, complete submission to Allah and Muhammad, mm -hmm. and whatever Muhammad decides. There is no arguing against Muhammad because he's the human voice of Allah, right. whether Muslims admit it or not. But here's another thing, 33, 36, chapter 33, verse 36. And this is all Quranic verses. Christians write these down. Muslims pay attention to what your own Quran says. Chapter 33, verse 36. And it becometh not, it's unbecoming a believing man or a believing woman when Allah and his messenger. I want to emphasize that. It's not just Allah what Allah and does. His Allah and his messenger have decided an affair for them, when Allah and Muhammad agree concerning a matter, that they should, after that, claim any say in their affair. Let me explain what that means. A true Muslim, a true believing man, believing woman, cannot disagree, go against anything Allah and Muhammad has decided for them. 
Once it's decided, they can only perfectly obey. And then wow. it says, so is rebellious. Whoever is rebellious to Allah and his messenger, he verily goeth astray and error manifest. So the Quran is quite clear. You must perfectly submit to Muhammad's decisions because Muhammad is simply the human voice of Allah. I would say actually that Allah is actually uh, Muhammad's puppet because whatever Muhammad wants, Allah is there rushing to his satisfaction to fulfill his desires, which we'll right. talk about. Anyway. Yes. Now the final verse, 1826. This tells you that human legislation, human rules, human laws cannot override, supersede the Quran. So that's why that Muslim in New York said clearly, hey, if the Quran says you can marry premature minors, the hell with what others say, the hell with the U.S. Constitution, the hell with, you know, human legislation. These are man-made laws we submit to Allah and His Messenger. Right. 1826, 18 <laughs> verse 26. Wow. Say, wow. chapter 18 verse 26, say, Allah is best aware how long they tarried. Mm -hmm. His is the invisible of the heavens and the earth. How clear of sight is he and keen of hearing. They have no wali, protecting friend beside him, and he makes none to share in his government, in his wow. legislation, in his rule. Wow. End of story. <laughs> Thank you. You know, that's one thing about, you know, just the word Islam, you know, because in, uh, in uh, the West, they, they're saying that it means, comes from peace, the word peace, but the word Islam means surrender, submission, perfect submission to Muhammad and when you read those verses you just see it's total oh my goodness just uh, abdicating your own intellect you know that's one thing father Zechariah always says you know because the Quran says don't ask questions about things that if you if you knew it might hurt you you know that you know that's one thing father Zechariah has constantly says he says I just want one thing just use the brain God gave you you know when you see things like this your own conscience says bucks it and says no that's wrong. He says, use that because you're going to be judged by God according to what you, you, how you used your mind, you know, and your thoughts. Um, I, I want to just uh, uh, to go ahead and show the next video. And I just want to uh, get your comment on this. Yes. Could we put, up, put the second video, please? Uh, um, we're just having a, a little bit of, of a technical problem, so we're just going to be, we're going to just... Uh... Qanat al -Fadi. حزين ده انت كنت مالي الجو كلام ومرح شايفك تعيس كان كل الناس حواليك حاسين بفرح شايفك حزين ده انت كنت مالي الجو كلام ومرح شايفك تعيس كان كل الناس حواليك حاسين بفرح Okay. All right. We're back. Sorry about that. We had a little bit of a technical glitch there, but we're back. Everything's good. Uh, could we go ahead and show that second video? Is it possible to do that? Okay. Sam, you know what, what you maybe understood what was, she was asking. She was talking uh, to this man, he was, uh, you know, one of the chief uh, sheikhs, imams of Al-Azhar University. And, right. she, and she was asking him, his name is Jamal Qutb, and she was asking him, what is the possession of your right hand, the, the you know, slave, sex slaves? And he said, 
this is a historical, historical reality that may still exist today. That's what he said about it. Now, when he says may exist, he's not saying it doesn't. He's saying it can and it is, right? Yeah, it does exist. And, you know, I'm going to show you another video later which says absolutely it exists, you know. But, you know. If, if, if you want me to comment on it, yes. where does he get it from? I think it's important for the people to realize. I'm just going to mention some of the verses where that expression, yes. right hands possess, right. your right hands possess, I'm going to just run down some of the verses, and we need to comment on specific ones to show how grossly immoral this teaching is, and that there are verses in which if you read in isolation from the hadith or the commentators, the mufassirin, if you just read those verses in their context, the Quran also sanctions that women can have sex slaves as well. Yes. If you just read the Quran and not what the Muslim expositors try to say and explain away. But the verses are chapter 4, verse 3. There you'll find the reference, your right hands possess, chapter 4, verse 3. Chapter 4, verse 24, which we need to look at because not only does chapter 4, verse tw uh, 24 talk about what your right hands possess, it actually sanctions the raping of not just captives, but married captives. So it sanctions adultery. So we got to talk about that, God willing. So chapter 4, verse 24 and 25, 4, 24, 25. Chapter 23, verse 6, but you got to read 5 and 6 for the context. Chapter 23, verses 5 to 6. Chapter 24, 33 is interesting as well because it talks about compelling your slave girls to prostitution. Mm -hmm. Chapter 33, 50 to 51, which is in relation to Muhammad and his right-hand possessions. Chapter 33, verses 50 to 51. And again, chapter 70, verse 30. But read 70 and 29 and 30 in context. Now, with that said, if you want me to elaborate on some of these passages, let me know, because I don't know when you want to go to the next clip. Do you want me to talk about 424? Um, yeah, I'd, um, yes, yeah, if you could go ahead and talk about that one. That's like the major one. So. And the reason why it's major, because it teaches three things. Not only can you have sex with captives that you have enslaved, you can have sex with married captives married and captives. it's and it's this is what i would call pretty much rape right so that it teaches that you can take women captive even married women captive you can rape these women married women and therefore commit adultery because what do you call it when you take a, a woman who's married captive and you have sex with her against her will. If that's not rape and adultery, I don't know what is. But let me read the passage, and then we're going to read the application of this passage by Muhammad and his jihadis, how Muhammad implemented this passage according to Islam's most reliable sources. Chapter 4, verse 24. Also prohibited are women already married, except those, those whom your right, right hands hand possess. Now, what does that mean? Why would I have a married woman as part of those that my right hand possesses. That's just simply an Arabic idiom, meaning your possession, what you possess, what you own, what you've enslaved. Right. Well, because it's talking about the context of warfare, where Muhammad would send his thugs, his jihadis, into military expeditions, right? And they would attack uh, places and, and sneak up on people unawares, kill the men, take their families captive, their wives and children. And in some cases where the men were not killed, their wives were taken as slaves, and the men would have sex with them, raping them with their husbands still alive. Now, in case people don't believe me, let me read to you the application of this passage, why this passage was re revealed. As they say in Arabic, Asbab al nuzul the reason of revelation, right? The yeah. reason, and I put in quotation marks, because this is no revelation of the true God. This is revelation from Satan, not the true God revealed in Jesus Christ. Okay, Sunan Abu Dawud. I'm reading the English translation of Sunan Abu Dawood, and for the benefit of all non-Arabic <clears throat> viewers, you can go to the website sunnah.com, S-U-N-N-A-H.com. This is the most comprehensive website that has all the major Sunni Islamic traditions translated into English for free. Sunan Abu Dawood, Nisai, Majah, it's all there for free. Wow, great. This comes from Sunan Abu Dawood, volume 2 in English, number 2150. Abu Sayyid al-Khudri said, the apostle of Allah sent a military expedition, Khazwa, to Autas on the occasion of the Battle of Hunayn. Notice this is a battle, this is war. 
They met their enemy and fought with them. They defeated them and took them captives. Some of the companions of the Apostle of Allah were reluctant. They showed more moral sense Conscience. than Allah. Yeah. They're because the law written in their hearts, though tainted by sin, was convicting them. The yeah. law that the true God has put in our hearts. They were reluctant to have intercourse with the female captives in the presence of their husbands were unbelievers. Yes. Wow. But now watch what Allah and his messenger decided. So Allah the exalted, Azwajal, sent down the Quranic verse, and he then cites chapter 4, verse 24, and all married women are forbidden unto you, save those captives whom your right, right hands hand possess. Forever. That is to say, they are lawful for them when they complete their waiting period to make sure they're not pregnant. Did you catch that, my brother? Yes. Did you see what we just read? The reason why chapter 4, verse 24 was revealed Pretty is good. because married women had right. been taken captive. Their husbands were prisoners. The Muslim men were ashamed to touch these married women. Allah said, don't be ashamed. They're your possession. Sleep with them, and when you're done, you can sell them off. Now, here's my question to you. What sane woman... What moral woman would gladly sleep with her captors, knowing that they had just attacked her village or her city or her town, murdered people there, taken their possessions, and their husbands are still alive? Would any of them gladly sleep with their captors? <laughs> wow. See, your laughter tells you what the answer is. So that means this passage does not command the Muslims to first get their permission. permission. They have no say-so because they are their property. Once the Muslim takes a woman captive, she has no say-so. She is his property. property. And he can rape her, and she has no say in the matter, right. which is why you have maids when they go to Muslim countries and yeah. work for Muslim families, they get raped. But yeah. the Muslims say, that's not rape. That's our right. You're yes. our maid. Yes, you? yes. You know, it reminds me of what, you know, it just like it reminds me of what ISIS was doing. It's exactly right. when ISIS was taking all those women captive. And what was uh, President Obama saying? You know, what was, you know, the, the prime minister of England saying, you know, what was, uh, you know, CNN saying, you know, what was, uh, you know, the MSNBC saying and the New York Times and the Washington Post. They were all they were like parrots and puppets saying this is not Islam, dude. This is in the Koran. This is in the Koran. Not only is it Islam, it's from the supreme authority of Islam, the Koran. That this, what ISIS was doing to these women is absolutely permissible, and nobody has the right to say what the Quran permits is wrong. Yes. And, and In fact, go ahead. If we still have a little more time, do you want to go to the clip, or do we have a few more minutes? Um, you know, go ahead. Say what you're going to say. Because I want to read another tradition okay. that directly addresses chapter four, verse twenty-four. Because I want to see. I want the non-Muslims and the Muslims who don't know this to see how evil, immoral, despicable this religion is and then contrast it to the Torah of Moses, <coughs> revelation from God. Yeah. This comes from Sahih Muslim number 3371. Sahih Muslim number 3371. Abu Surma said to Abu Sayyid al-Khudri, O oh, Abu Sayyid, did you hear Allah's messenger mentioning al-Azl? <laughs> I'll explain. The, the, the Hadith will explain what Azl is, al-Azl. He said yes and added, we went out with Allah's messenger on the expedition to Bil Mustalliq and took captive, now notice the description, took captive some excellent Arab, Arab women. Oh, were they excellent. Oh. <laughs> and we desired them, for we were suffering from the absence Aww. of our wife. We were burning with lust, and we wanted to rape these women, but at the same time, we also desired ransom for them. In other words, we wanted to get money to release them. So now we're in a conundrum. If we have sex with them, Aww. they may get pregnant. Aww. They may carry our seed. But we don't want them to get pregnant because we want to sell them off and make money. So now watch Allah's masterful solution. <laughs> I was going to so say this. <laughs> right? <laughs> I was so, going to say this when you said about Muhammad, the, that, the, that the guys that he was with had more conscience than he did, more conscience than his God did. You know, when, go ahead. <laughs> But now watch the response of Allah and his messenger. Instead of Allah giving them the power, like the Holy Spirit gives us power to crucify our flesh, to <laughs> constrain our flesh, to control ourselves by the power of the Holy Spirit, notice what Allah does. So we decided to have sexual intercourse with them, but by observing Azil. And now yeah. this is the translators in parentheses explaining what Azil is. Withdrawing 
pulling out the male sexual organ before emission of semen to avoid conception. Coitus okay? interruptus. <laughs> yes, coitus, the Latin term coitus interruptus, 100%. But we said, we are doing an act, whereas Allah's messenger is amongst us. Why not ask him? So we asked Allah's messenger and he said, it does not matter if you do not oh. do it. For every soul that is to be born up to the day of resurrection will be born. In other words, whether you, whether you, whether you do coitus interruptus, I want to give the G-rated version in respect of my sisters and children are watching. And coitus me. interruptus, right? Whether you do it or not, if she's meant to get pregnant, she's meant to get pregnant, you can't stop. So you want to do it, do it. If you don't want to do it, that's okay. Yeah. Because Allah's decree is ultimate. So if Allah's decree, she'll get pregnant by you, you yeah. can't stop it. Yes. So notice what they're discussing. Women taken captive, being raped, and their concern is not the physiological, emotional, psychological, spiritual well-being being of the woman. It's more of, hmm, what if she gets pregnant? She carries my child. I don't want her to get pregnant because I want to sell her to make money off of her. But I still want to enjoy her by ravishing her and raping her. This is the morality of Allah and his messenger. Wow. And this is what Muslims are calling us to. Can you believe this? Uh, yes. You know, uh, it's like I, I, I want Muslims to hear this. I want them to see, you know, because they're lying. They're being lied to. You know, they're, they, they're being lied to and they're lying because of it, you know. And they're given this picture of Islam in the West that is so deceptive when the words of Muhammad exactly contradict and shows you how disgusting, how disgusting this person was. And uh, wow, thank you for explaining that for us. I'm going to uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and play this next uh, video clip real quickly. Could you play the next uh, video, please? ظهرت في أحد البرامج الفضائية وقلت يا جماعة اللي عنده شغالة في البيت مش مسيحية أو يهودية أيوة له الحق أن يتعامل معها ملك يمين. Okay, let me just tell you what she said there. This is uh, this guy is like the top guy at Al Azhar University, which is the top Sunni organ organization associate or institution in the world. And she said to him, she said, "You, Sheikh Jamal Kutub, appeared on a TV program and said that anyone who has a woman." working in his house who is not Christian or Jewish, that means a Muslim, has the right to treat her like possession of the right hand. And he's going, I said that? And she says, we have the video. We have the video if you want to see it. You know. And again, I'm saying this to say, this isn't something from 1400 years ago or some cave in Afghanistan. This is now. Yes. Yes, 100% now. It's in Islam. It's in the Quran. It's in the Hadith. And so they can't deny this. So, And I see that in the clip he was laughing. Maybe he's laughing because she embarrassed him because she's exposing him. But why would he be embarrassed? Why would he be ashamed of what his own religious sources teach? I, 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 that really baffles me, especially this is in a Muslim country, right? Where yeah, it's she, in Egypt, yeah. yeah. Okay, so here's she's in Egypt. I just be bold. I said, yeah, and? What's your problem? <laughs> What's your problem? Do you have a problem with what Allah and his message? Now, I can understand trying to contextualize it for Westerners living in America or in Europe where the government is in the hands of the kuffar, the uh, unbelievers. Yeah. You want to sugarcoat Muhammad and and his teachings. But and why would you, yeah. would you be embarrassed in Egypt, of all places, or in Saudi Arabia? Right. Pretty much the Muslims are uh, the dominant force, the dominant power. They're the majority. And they can impose their will on people by murdering them. Right. I'm even surprised she hasn't been threatened let alone, you know, uh, you, attack, this right? this turned into a huge controversy. And, and he actually got up and walked off on live television. He got up and walked off the TV. But he came back a few minutes later because he was so intimidated by her. But I want to show you the next video because yes. this next video is also another one of the top professors at El Azhar University that, who was also on this interview because I want you to hear what this guy says. Uh, can we play the next video clip, please? بقى ما ملكة أيمانكم وحالة الرق وإمتى يبقى في ملكة أيمانكم ولا ما فيش يعني ليه في بينا كده دكتور مبروك حوالين الموضوع أولا كلمة ملك اليمين القباية دي ملك يمين وكرسي ملك يمين كل ما يملك هو ملك يمين ده في الأصل اللغوي وعبر باليمين لأن اليمين أقوى من الشمال Okay, uh, now this is just repeating something that you already said, Sam, but I wanted them to hear it 
from this is Sheikh Mabruk is his name. Mabruk? Yeah. <laughs> one of the uh, Mabruk, yeah. One of the top top men at Al Azhar University. And she said to him, What does Melikatilya mean? What does possession of your right hand mean? And this is what he says verbatim. He says, This cup is Melikatilya is my possession of my right hand, because I own it. He says, This chair that I'm sitting on is my possession, because I own it. Anything you own is possession of your right hand. So he was being very honest there. This is what it means. And, you know, explaining exactly what the Quran means when it says 16 times, Melekat al yeah. yeah. Now, be, before you go to another clip, do you, are you going to another clip or do you want me to expound? No, no, go, go ahead. I, I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Okay. I'm, gonna, I'm going to address him, but first I want to just share how beautiful how majestic and glorious God's true word, the Holy Bible is. And I'm going to address what he said, and he's absolutely right. That ex expression in Arabic, what yeah. your right hand possesses, means anything you own. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, it's not just inanimate objects. Mm -hmm. That expression also includes humans that you own as your property. Right. That yes. can include captive men, yes. children, women in particular. So yeah. it's anything that you own, either because you purchased it yeah. or you've taken them captive during mm -hmm. war. So, for example, if they attack Chicago, where I'm at, and they take me captive, I'm now part of their right-hand possession. Right. My, my children would be part of their right-hand possession. So that phrase doesn't just refer to inanimate things, yeah. cars or, or chairs. It, and not only just animals, it refers to humans that you've enslaved, specifically women. Now, I want folks to remember what the Quran and the Hadith stated. Muslim men, when they attack a place, can take those women captive, rape those women, even married women, and sell them off. That's a right enjoined upon the Muslims from Allah and His Messenger. Now, Muslims keep telling us Muhammad is a prophet like Moses. Well, let's see what the true God of Moses told Moses that the Israelites are to do when they're in warfare and they find a captive woman. Don't forget what I'm about to read is about 2,200 years before the time of Muhammad. 2,200 years before the false prophet Muhammad came up with his legislation. Deuteronomy 21, 10 to 14. Note the rights, the honor God gives to captive women. And even commentators admit, in light of its historical context it's historical context this was something unheard of even among the ancient pagan civilizations it was revolutionary that tells you how much god loves all his creatures especially women yes. deuteronomy 21 10 to 14 let me read it for you deuteronomy 21 10 to 14 when you go to war against your enemies and yehovah the lord your god delivers them into your hands and you take captives watch if you notice among the captives a beautiful woman and are attracted to her you may take her as your wife. Wife. Doesn't say take her as your right hand, <laughs> your sex slave. Yeah. Take her as your wife. Now watch here. You can't even have sex with her right away. Yeah. Hey, Sam. Bring her into hey, your Sam. home. Excuse me, Sam. Yes. Uh, we just have one caller just real quick. Let's just take this call and come right back to that. I, 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 I really love what you're talking about because that yeah, is so it. important to have that contrast. So. Um, hello, uh, Brother Andy. How are you? Yeah. Good, thank you. Thank you for calling. Uh, yeah, the whole thing is really, in a way, it's puzzling, and then on the other hand, it's what you would expect. The, the preoccupation with having sex with everybody they want to, as long as they are female, yes. seems to be the main uh, aim of what the Quran <laughs> approves of. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, you know, Andy, that, you know, that is a real, you could take that from so many angles because, you know, Sam was talking about a book called the Esbab in Nizul, which is the reason why the verses came to Muhammad. And, and so many times Muhammad saw a woman that he wanted and, and, or he had some sexual issue. And so a verse would miraculously come down to him and say that, you know, this is permitted for Muhammad. And, and, and then it would become canonized because it became part of the Quran. It became part of the Quran. 
Wow. Okay. I get it. Yeah, and you know what, Andy, if I could just tell you one other thing. His wife, Mohammed's wife, you know, he married a woman who was six years old. She, he had sex with her when she was nine, and she was with him for nine years before he died. You know what she said once to Mohammed? She said, because he got one of these verses, you know, that, uh, to permit him to have sex with his daughter-in-law, and, 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 and his wife said to him, and this is in the Muslim books, Aisha said to Muhammad, she said, it's amazing how your God hastens to fulfill your desires. You're jumping ahead, brother. <laughs> I was about to read those yeah. statements. You're jumping ahead, because I want to show about the sexual yeah. privileges. Yeah. But let me know when you want me to continue in yeah. Deuteronomy. Did, did, uh, did you want to address, uh, speak, say anything to Andy, Sam? No, no you've covered it. Okay. But I do, I do want to make sure Deuteronomy 21 is read in context, not interrupted, because oh. that's important, okay. the Word of God. Okay. You know, so let me know. Thank you so much, Andy, for calling. God bless you, brother. Okay. I really appreciate it. You. Thank you, brother. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go yeah. ahead, Sam. No, okay. I just want to, yeah, I'm sure that the callers, our Christian brothers, will understand when we want to finish a verse. Because okay. there's nothing like he hearing the Word of God. That's true. Being yes. proclaimed and understood. Because I don't want the audience to lose the point I just made yes. because of interruption. So let me repeat it again. Yeah, please do. Like yes. Caller, I want to make you wait. Okay. I'm going to make the callers wait. Okay. Because this is the Word of God, and I want them to listen. So callers, okay. listen to the Word of God. Because if you don't, you're not going to see the contrast. So yes. again, yes. 2,200 years before Muhammad was born, let's see what the true God said concerning the treatment of captive women. When you go to war against your enemies and the Lord, Yahovah, your God, delivers them into your hands and you take captives. If you notice among the captives a beautiful woman uh, uh, and are attracted to her, you may take her as your wife. That's where wife. we got it from. So again, let me expound on this. Not as your right-hand possession, as a sex slave, sex slave, as your wife. And you can't even have sex with her right away because then it says, as bring her into your home, have her shave her head. These are all the signs of mourning. When you mourn the dead, you shave your head, you put on sackcloth and ashes. That was the way they mourned their dead. So sh have her shave her head, trim her nails, put aside the clothes she was wearing when captured. So to honor her, give her time to mourn, get rid of those ca clothes that you took her in in captivity so she's not reminded of her captivity. After she has lived in your house and mourned her father and mother for a full month, then you may go to her and be her husband. Wow. You don't rape her. You don't sleep with her. You Not be her, her owner. Husband. Be her husband. And she shall be your wife. Wow. Now, what happens wow. if there's a divorce? Because not every marriage lasts. And God made a concession, allowed these whites to divorce. If you're not pleased with her, let her go wherever she wishes. You must not sell her or treat her as a slave since you have dishonored her by divorcing her, sending her away. Did you catch the difference? Wow. With Muhammad. You can take a captive woman, even a married woman, rape her, even if you get her pregnant, and then sell her off. I'm Who cares? Still sell her. The God of Moses says, no. A woman that's taken captive, yeah. you don't touch her. Yeah. You want to mourn, get rid of her clothes that she was taken in captivity with, then marry her, treat her as a wife, give her the same rights as an Israelite woman, and when you divorce her, let her go, send her on her way to be free revolutionary and it shows the difference between the god of moses and the god of muhammad they're not the same god wow. so that was the point i wanted to to, to hammer at Thank now you me. asked me about right hand possessions and what the gentleman said that he said it means this cup yeah. is right he's right but it's not just inanimate objects it's also animate objects yes. and then there's something troubling Muslims claim that the Quran is the height of Arabic eloquence. It's unmatchable, inimitable. It cannot be imitated as a sign of Muhammad's prophethood. It's perfect Arabic. Yes. Well, this perfect Arabic Quran is written in such a way that the plain reading of it, especially to those who know Arabic, allows even women to have sex slaves without marrying them. Yes. And what am I talking about? Now, if you want to read the Arabic, it's up to you. If you have the Arabic Quran, chapter 23 of the Quran, mm -hmm. verses 5 to 6, Chapter 23, verses 5 to 6. I'm going to read it. Mm -hmm. Those who know Arabic will confirm this. Even Muslim expositors explain that, yes, the term here is general. It can mean spouse of either gender, meaning yes. your wife or your husband. But let me read it. Okay. And who guard their private parts. And we know what that means. Yes. The furuj, the furuj is That's, private. Yeah. We know what it means. Yeah. Those who guard their private parts, 
except uh, from their mates. As yeah. what? As what? And you know what the word aswaj is, right? Yes. Aswaj, zawaj is general. It can mean husband or wife, not mm -hmm. necessarily wife. Yes. When you want to speak of your wife, you use the word nisa. Oh. Nisa, right? Yes. Whereas the word zawaj or aswaj is general, inclusive yeah. of husbands. Spouse. And it's like spouse. Yeah. Spouse. Yes. So now it's saying, you who guard your private parts, except from your spouses, yes. or those whom their right hands possess, right. for surely are not blamable. Now understand, the plain reading of the passage is referring to men and women. Yes. It's saying, you men and women who guard your private parts can be sexually intimate with your spouses or those that your right hands possess. Right. Since it's general, that means even women can have right hand possession, meaning even women can have men as sex slaves. That's the plain reading of the Quran, and yes. I'm going to confirm it in a minute. I'm going to confirm it in a minute, mm -hmm. because the Hadith says that Omar ibn al-Khattab had to correct a woman who was having sex with her male slave, and what was her justification? She quoted chapter 23, verse 6, saying, the Quran says, I can enjoy my sex slave, my male sex slave, and he was livid. But let me read one more. Chapter 70, verses 29 to 30, says the same thing. Chapter 70, verses 29 to 30, and those who guard their private parts, except in the case of their spouses, it's azwaj again, zawaj, not nisa, and, and nisa, I'm sorry, it's general, except in the cases of their spouses, yes. or those whom their right hands possess, meaning you husbands, you wives, enjoy your spouses and enjoy your right, right hand possessions. It includes women as those who can enjoy their right hand possessions. Yes. In other words, the plain reading of the Quran, apart from the Hadith, mm -hmm. apart from the Sirah, apart from the commentators, apart from those the sources, plain the, Quran. <laughs> the plain reading of the Quran, women, you can have male sex slaves yeah. and party all you want. <laughs> now, that is how That's... it understood by even the Arabic speakers yes. of the Quran. I'm going to read Tafsir yes. Ibn Kathir. This is uh, Ibn Kathir's commentary on chapter 23, verse 6. Watch this, my brother. Katada said, a woman slept with her male slave. A woman was having sex with her male slave. So they brought her to Omar and they told him she understood verse 23, verse 6 to say that. Did you catch that? Yes. <laughs> she said, well, I read in my Quran yeah. that I can have sex with my spouse or those that I own, right-hand possession. Right. Now, what does Omar do? So Omar shaved the male slave head and let her go after expelling the slave from Medina and said the woman should marry anyone after that. Now, notice he could not refu refute her yes. exegetically. He could not refute her on the language of the Quran. He simply condemned this act even though she had the Quran on her side. Wow. Yes. You know, if you, uh, uh, this interview with Basma Wahba, he, this, this Imam Mabruk actually says that. <laughs> and he says it in a way like because he was being cornered. He was being cornered by Basma Wahba as she's talking to him. And so he says, hey, I got a surprise for you, Basma. This is, what, this is exactly what he said. He said, I got a surprise for you. Women can have slaves too. And he's, but he says something really interesting. He says, but you know what? Women can have all those sex slaves they want to. But you know what he says? He says, but because women have morals and they have wow. dignity, they don't do it. But you know how men are. That's what he says. He said wow. that to her. <laughs> uh, let, wow. Sam, let, I just want to go ahead and put up the next, uh, the next video clip right. real quick. And I'd like to get your comment on it. Mumkin, uh, can we put the next video clip on, please? Okay. This again, you know, we've we've talked about this, but I just wanted to, them to see it coming from the mouth of one of the top sheikhs in the world. And, and, and Basma asks, she says, does this apply? Does, do these verses apply today? And this imam says, are you kidding? They apply until the day of judgment. Yes, 100 percent. He's not lying. So praise the Lord Jesus Christ for these clips to confirm that it's not simply a Christian spin. Yeah, yeah. A misinterpretation of these sources. Muslims who are honest and not ashamed of their religion, especially when they live in Muslim dominant lands, unashamedly will admit, yep, this is what it says. And these are our rights till the end of, uh, end of the age. Now, let me explain to the non-Muslims what this means. 
we're talking about something that's not theoretical. It's happening, it's happening. in Muslim lands. You mentioned ISIS. Now, you non-Muslims, I pray that when you watch this, because it's going to be archived, I want you to let it sink in. If Muslims take over America, that means Muslims can take your wife, yeah. anyone's wife that's not a Muslim, rape them, sell them off, and take your children as slaves, and make you slaves, if not kill you, and there's nothing you can do about it. Absolutely nothing you can do about it. So this is not simply theory. theory. We're not reading something that's the theory. nature. We're reading something that has been implemented, put in practice since the time of that false wicked prophet Muhammad, and has brought untold suffering and misery to millions of lives for the past 1,400 years. And I know because I'm part of a magnificent community, the Assyrian Chaldean oh, community, yeah. that happened to be one of the first people groups to embrace Christianity, because our tradition goes back to the first century where the apostles of our Lord Jesus converted my ancestors and have maintained their Christian identity even during the onslaught of Muslims. And we have seen firsthand oh, yeah. the tyranny, yeah. the murdering spirit, the brutality, right. the sexual morality of this religion. We've lived under the the sword of Islam. And even here, here's what's ironic. You, you said they're Egyptians. Many people don't know that Egyptians are not Arabs. They're African. But yes. because of the Islamic takeover of the land and even the forcing of the Arabic language upon the Egyptians, people, when they, when they hear an Egyptian speak, they think he's Arab. Yeah. They're African. Yes. So if you, if you have people who are upset about the abuse that Africans have suffered by, let's say, the white white man, they should be just as appalled, more angry and livid against the Muslims and Muhammad who took Africans in Egypt, yes. enslaved them, yes. murdered their men, them. Yes. raped their women, and then forced them to speak a language other than own, their own. <laughs> yep. They should live yep. it, right? <laughs> Thank you, Matt. I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and play the next clip just because I want I'm, we're not going to be able to get through all of them, but I want I, I want to get your comments on these. Can we put the next clip up, please? <laughs> this this you, you know, the sources of Islam are uh, the Quran, the Hadith, and the biography, the Sira of Nebawiya, the life of Muhammad, because he's the yeah. perfect example. Well, right here, Besma is asking Sheikh Mabruk, she says to him yeah, that Muhammad had sex with Maria the Copt yeah. while she was still a slave girl. And, yes. and, and then she says to the Sheikh, she says, did it happen or not that Muhammad did this? You know what the Sheikh says? It's a, in Arabic, sarunus. That means it happened and a half. <laughs> Not only did it happen, it happened yeah. and a half, you know. He's just admitting that Muhammad, that the life of Muhammad justifies this. Yes, no, he's right. Maria, uh, Maria Koptia, Al -Koptia, she was a cop sent as a gift from, from <clears throat> Egypt. And not only did he have sex with her, he impregnated her. She gave birth to his son, Ibrahim, who died while a toddler, so that the, none of Muhammad's sons lived long enough. They all died while they were you know, young as toddlers. But even more so, a lot of people don't know that chapter 66 of the Quran, where Muhammad's wives are threatened, that Allah will replace them with better wives, that was revealed in the context of Muhammad having sex with Maria al Qubtiya or Mary the cop yeah. in Hafsa's home. Hafsa's now, let me explain home. this real quickly because I don't know how much time I have. <laughs> Hafsa was one of the wives of Muhammad. She's the yeah. daughter of Omar ibn al Khattab. Omar ibn al Khattab is the second uh, caliph. Right, right. Hey, Sam, excuse yes. me, Sam. I, I, um, I just, you know, we're running out of time and I just had yes. one more clip. And I, okay. I, I want to play this clip. And then I want you to just take us to the end after okay, you see fine. this, because this clip is golden. So, right. okay, if we could just put on that last clip, Munkin, the next uh, video clip. <laughs> Ah. 
قد ايه ركنا شوف النساء يبقى وان خفتم ان لا تقسطوا في اليتامى فانكحوا ما طاب لكم من النساء مثنى وثلاث ورباع فان خفتم ان لا تعدلوا فواحده او ما ملكت ايمانكم اجل غيها يعني هعمل لها ايه دلوقتي؟ اسلوبها باستيكه؟ هل المطلوب ان عشان انا ابقى دين جميل ودافع عنه هعمل ايه في القران؟ وده السؤال الاولاني يعني احنا لو بنجيب حديث اوكي okay. I want to just tell you what happened there. He's, he, he hits the nail on the head right here. He says, he says, what am I supposed to do with the Quran? That's right. He says, I believe the Quran. Do you believe the Quran is the word of Allah that's unchangeable from the loh al-mahfud, the preserved talent? He says, when it says, uh, you know, possessions of your right, what am I supposed to, he's asking this. He says, what am I supposed yeah. to do with it? Do I just take an eraser and erase it? You know, exactly. go ahead. We have a minute left, Sam. Go ahead and, and just. He's absolutely correct. At he's least absolutely. he's on the fact yes. that the Quran teaches it. And if you believe the Quran is the word of God, then you have no choice but to submit to its wicked, evil, immoral teachings. It's murdering, lustful injunctions that give Muslims the right to murder people, to rape women, to pretty much have, for lack of a better word, orgies and to even sanction prostitution and adultery, which, Lord willing, in future sessions we can get into. But real quickly, because time is short, 66, Muhammad tells Hafsa that she goes to visit her father. Yes. Muhammad then takes Mary the cop into Hafsa's home, has sex with her. Hafsa walks in, catches him in the act. She's crying hysterically. Muhammad swears, I won't touch her again. <laughs> and then Hafsa tells Aisha, and then Muhammad gets upset, threatens to divorce them, and then a verse comes down saying, you... You don't have a right to forbid what Allah has made lawful to you, and if these women act up, you can divorce them or replace them with better wives. In other words, Allah went out of his way to say, you don't need to peace Hafsa. You can have sex with Maria, yes. ma Mary the cop, anytime you want, even in Hafsa's own house yeah. and on her own bed, and she better like it or will get rid of her and replace her with someone better than her. That You know what? That's that the that's a whole episode as uh, that story is <laughs> sam we're 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 out of time but as usual you you know what we want we want the eyes to open to the reality of this demonic satanic religion called islam and what the source of of what came to muhammad and i thank you so much for your uh, very concise very clear very powerful things that you said today i really appreciate it and like we always say Open your heart to the Lord Jesus. You were not calling you to just leave Islam and be nothing. Come to the Lord Jesus. He'll do for you what he did for me, what he did for Sam, what he's done to millions. He'll give you life and he will honor, respect you. God loves you. Uh, we love you here at Kanat al Fadi. I thank you so much for being with us and I hope that you'll be with us in a future episode of the program, Message of Grace. <laughs>